Good morning, welcome. I know it's a cold morning, but seeing your smiling faces make my heart warm. Thank you for the warm welcome, especially to Professor Valerie. Irina, where are you? Yes, and uh, all your professors, and also I've spoken with your dean, Professor Barikov, as well as your vice rector and different deans and rectors, and I must thank you for them because they have specially invited me here to come all the way from Singapore. I was in Tarachichenko University last week. I finished my series of lectures, and your rector himself telephoned me personally. Gary, you must come to Kharkiv. We are waiting for you. So when your rector called me, I cannot say no. Therefore, I'm here because I really, truly enjoy the opportunity to come to share with you, to share openly, to share sincerely, and to share honestly. And I hope in this sharing, you can learn as much as I can learn from you. Now, my topic lecture today, can you see in the front here? Can you see? Show me again. Very good. Topic is from third world to first world. Singapore transformation experience, critical policy lessons for Ukraine. Let me ask you, are you students from international um, economics relations? So you're expert, you know everything about economy and the world. Okay, maybe I can learn something from you. You can be my professor too. Okay, now, um, Singapore. How many have you been to Singapore? No one. Have you heard of Singapore? Yes. Everybody have heard of Singapore, nobody has been to Singapore. Your president, Poroshenko. He went to Singapore at the end of 2014 to visit our first Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew before he passed away. In fact, Poroshenko was the last president to visit Lee Kuan Yew, our first founding Prime Minister. And uh, in fact, both Yanukovych and Poroshenko, they both had visited Singapore before. And uh, they went all the way to try to study some useful policy lessons, how to develop your society, how to develop your economy, how to make Ukraine better, richer and brighter for everyone. But today you're lucky. You don't have to go to Singapore. Singapore come to you. <laughs> All right, shall we begin? Yeah. Next. Now, this is the map of Southeast Asia, also called ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Next. Ayana is very, very helpful. She has volunteered to sit here patiently and handle the slides. Thank you, Ayana. <laughs> so, this is the map of Singapore, yeah? Sing map of Singapore. Next and the flag of Singapore. Now, everywhere I go, everyone I meet, every time they ask me the question. And what is the question? Is Singapore a city, <laughs> an island, a country, or a state? So what would be your answer? Altogether. Everything. Well done. <laughs> Smart guy, yeah? <laughs> everything. Singapore is everything. It means that Singapore is so... what? Singapore is so small. small. Singapore is so small. We don't have enough land. You know, from one end of Singapore, here, you land at the Changi International Airport on the east. If you drive all the way to the west, known as Tuas here, where my university, Nanyang Technology University, Singapore, from one end to the other end, it only takes you 20 minutes. <coughs> 20 minutes. <coughs> Uh, I took the train from Kii yesterday to come to Kaki. It took me 4 hours and 35 minutes. Yeah? If you were to take a train from Kaki to Lviv, I think it's like 12 hours. Yeah? Singapore, 20 minutes. Yeah? You know, and um, I'm trying to give you a sense of geography. You know, very important. And also, because Singapore is so small, we have no choice. We have not enough land. We don't have even enough land to plant banana plantation. No joke. You guys are so lucky. Ukraine is so... So... Right? 12 hours from Lviv to Kyiv to Kharkiv. Right? Not to mention down to Odessa. You have big Kaparati mountain. You have long Nipro river. You have beautiful, rich black earth. All your wheat field and all the sunflower field and everything. Whenever I went to Nipro, Petro, Saporizhia, Odessa, Nikolai, I went all over your country. I've been 
all over your country for the past three, four years. As I shared with professor, as I shared with your rector, other European and Asian universities pay me to lecture and share with them my knowledge. But for Ukraine, every year I come, I do it for free. Why? Because I believe in helping your country. I know your country is now going through a very critical period of national reform and reconstruction. And I hope and pray that there will be a better future, brighter future for everyone. That's why I'm willing to come to help for free. All right? So it gives me a special meaning to help your country at this moment. So coming back to Singapore, there may be some useful policy lessons, some useful and critical, valuable lessons to learn, to apply for your country. And that's why I've been sharing in other universities like Taraf Jechenko, Ivan Franka, or Disa Meshnikov, and other places as well as in your Diplomatic Academy. And tomorrow, I think I'll be sharing with your Institute of Public Administration where your governors are. Okay, now, look. So Singapore is here, right here. Can you find Singapore? Tiny little dot right in the center of Southeast Asia. We are squeezed between two big giant Muslim neighbors like Malaysia and Indonesia. And then you've got other ASEAN countries like Thailand, like Vietnam, like Cambodia, Myanmar, and the Philippines. Who has been to Southeast Asia? None of you has been to Asia. Anyone been to Asia? Yes, where, madam? Wow, you've been to Vietnam and China. Uh huh, you've seen the world. <laughs> well done, international economic relations expert, the next ambassador of Ukraine. Next. So these are the scenes of Singapore. Singapore is very young, only about 50 years old. They just celebrated the golden anniversary two years ago. These are the pictures at Marina Bay. See the fireworks, right? Just celebrated. Their golden anniversary means how old? Golden anniversary means 50 years old. Have you celebrated your golden anniversary? Your golden anniversary? 50 years old. Next. Next. Some more pictures of Singapore. Now, very interesting. Tell me. Next. 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 Okay, as I say, you don't have to go to Singapore. Singapore come to you today. Tell me, this is the symbol of Singapore called the Mer Lion. Mer Lion. Remember? Now tell me, the head, what is the head? Head of a? Of a what? Mer Lion. So head of a lion, right? What does it symbolize? Lion. Symbolize what? Strength. Strength. Power, power, I love the word power, yes. Have you been to live? Courage, yes. Masculinity, male, in the male model, right? And the body? Body, body of, uh, I was in Odisha University, one girl told me the body is like mermaid, it's called Risola, is it? That's a, that's a Russian word or what? Risalka, is it? Risalka. <laughs> is it right? So, so it's like body of a mermaid. Mermaid represent what? Represent. Uh, fairy tale. <laughs> fairy tale. Yeah. Okay. Fairy tale. Uh, beauty, elegance, femininity. Understand? So, 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 lion head is for male masculinity. Mermaid body is femininity. So it's yin and yang. You heard of yin yang? It's a symbol of life, of harmony, so to speak. So water pouring out twenty four seven. Water. Yeah. Maybe people believe that if the girls go and get some water. Wash the face, make you look younger, prettier. Maybe you should try, yeah? One day. All right? Or you drink the water, you might strike Toto, lot Toto or something. Bring you luck. Lucky water. All right, this is a famous International Royal Botanic Garden. Giant, tall structures, trees, plants, lights, everything. And this is the famous uh, Marina Bay Sands, a six-star hotel, which is actually a casino hotel owned by Sands. Heard of Sands? Las Vegas Sands? Yeah, the multi-billionaire. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's a bit sad, right? The most famous landmark in Singapore. It used to be the Merlion, but now more and more it becomes the modern landmark. Do, do you get me? Yeah. You don't. <coughs> what's so sad? <laughs> Tell me what's so sad. It used to be the traditional symbol of lion, which is Mer lion, yin and yang, but now in more advertisement, even in my university, the logo, for promotion, sometimes they don't use this anymore. They use this thing. It's a six-star American casino hotel. Casino. So Singapore has become from old, rich, traditional culture to modern American casino capitalism. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
<laughs> yeah, so that's why it's a bit sad. But never mind, we'll come back to that later. Next. More pictures, Singapore? Yes, next. Next, 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 next. What you're seeing is a famous Changi International Airport. Singapore may be small, but our airport is big. In fact, it has been voted the best airport in the world for many years. Look, see the garden? You won't believe it. This is a Singapore compared to your <laughs> Boris Co airport in Kiev or even the London. I've been around the world, I've been to all the airports. I can tell you no one can compare to this. Agree? Next. So you see, even for the world top 100 airports, Changi International Airport Singapore has been number one for more than 10 years now. Next is Incheon, Korea, Munich, Germany, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Zurich, and so on. For airlines, Number one is Emirates. You know where Emirates? Dubai. Next is Qatar. Next Singapore, Qatar, and so on. In fact, Singapore Airlines used to be number one for many times, for many years. And Emirates and Qatar are very new airlines. When they started, you know, uh, they just poached the staff. Some of my ex-students working in Singapore Airlines were poached. You know poach? That means to say, hey, you're a manager working for Singapore Airlines. Come and join me, Qatar. Come and join me, you know, Dubai. I pay you, what's the pay? 10,000, I give you 20,000. Tomorrow you come. Why? Because the Arabs got... <laughs> Sorry, no offense, any Arabs here? <laughs> I heard this is an international stu um, student body. You have people from Arabia and Dubai. Anyone from Dubai? Yeah. Buy me a Ferrari. <laughs> Thank you. They are so, you know, shh. I didn't say anything, yeah? I just, you know what I mean? Next. Okay, come on, Singapore. Singapore is, um, uh, go back, go back. Uh, okay, never mind, leave it here first. You know Singapore, something very strange about Singapore, because I was telling you that Singapore is so small, right? And don't, we don't have enough land, therefore we have to maximize, we have to maximize land usage. That means to say our population density is very high. You know, our population density is one of the highest in the world. You know what's population density? That means to say, people stay in high-rise buildings. 50, 60, 70 storey. Okay, what's the tallest building here? Kharki. 25 is the shortest building in Singapore. <laughs> the tallest building in Kiev, I was told, is only about 30 odd storey. Which is also very low in Singapore. Even in London, Paris very low. My office is 50 story in Singapore, 50, which is average. And you know what? The tallest mountain in Singapore, Bukit Timah Hill, is only 150 meters, about 30 odd stories. Do you get it? You don't get it. So from my office window, when I'm doing my work, I can see my friend John camping on the Singapore mountain. I say, hey, hi John, how is the camping down there? <laughs> I'm, I know you're laughing, but it's true. I'm not saying bad things about my country, but I have to be telling you the truth, the fact. Can you imagine, right? You, it, Ukraine is so lucky, you have big Kaparati mountain. I was just like, hey, John, how are you doing down there? You know? And from my office window, if I turn to my right, I can see Indonesia. <laughs> I'm not joking, Batam Bin Island, Indonesia, which is about 20, 20 minutes boat ride. I turn to my left, I can see Johor Bahru, Malaysia. That tells you how big Singapore is, or rather how small it is. Right? So that's the irony, the geographical irony of Singapore. And the geographical constraints of Singapore determine both its economic strategy and its geopolitical strategy. Because I understand from your professor, you are also expert in international relations. If you know what I mean, geopolitical implications. So when I lecture at the Diplomatic Academy, your ambassadors, the Ukrainian ambassadors to them, they like to listen to the word geopolitical strategies. You know, they love that word. Yeah, you know what it means, right? Give me a second. I don't know why. I think it must be a warm, wonderful response to make me feeling warmer. So give me a minute. So our, can you go on? Yes. So if you look carefully at the slide there, pardon me. Uh, Singapore is an open economy. It's the most open economy in the world. It's also known as a poster child of globalization.
Pardon me a second. Any... Okay, can you hear me now? Sorry for the wardrobe malfunction. It's the most open economy in the world. So it's a high beta economy. It's also called a poster child of globalization. So that means it's subject to the full forces of globalization. That means to say, if the global economy is good, Singapore economy will rocket. If global economy is bad, Singapore economy will crash. It's called high beta. Ukraine, low beta, good and bad, yeah? So in fact, Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore first prime minister, we embarked on globalization more than 50 years ago, long before globalization, the term was even invented. He can foresee the trends of globalization 50 years ahead, more than any other world leaders. Because at the time, 50 years ago, you're talking about the Cold War in the 1950s, 60s, after World War II, Right? Um, when you were still part of the Soviet Empire, the Iron Bloc, and you know, that kind of thing. You see, it's a very, very different world. That time was Stalin and, you know, Mao Zedong and, you know, you know what, Churchill and Roosevelt and Harry Truman. Those were the years, very tumultuous, turbulent years. And you have got all the new post-colonial leaders. You know, many of the countries belonging to the British Empire, belonging to the French Empire, they went independent. Singapore, example, Malaysia, right? Uh, and many other, India, many other countries, and Africa especially. And many of these newly independent countries, the presidents and, and leaders, like uh, you're talking about who? Uh, Fidel Castro, Cuba, uh, Yugoslavia, you have uh, who? Who was a strong man then? Tito. Tito. And uh, Ghana, Africa, you have anyone from Africa here? Ghana, you have Nkrumah, the famous post-colonial leader. China, you have Mao Zedong, Zhao Enlai. India, you have Nero, Soeharto, Sukarno in Indonesia. All these very charismatic leaders of the third world. They come together, they form what we call the non-aligned movement, the, the neutral, independent movement. They were mostly against colonialism, against capitalism. So they are against multinational companies. You got me? But Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, think very differently. Right? He is not pro-capitalism, he is not pro-Marxism or socialism, he is pro-pragmatism. You know what is pragmatism? Yes. Yeah, okay, very interestingly, very interestingly, because everywhere I go lecture, everywhere I go, everyone asks me the same question. Is, is Lee Kuan Yew Singapore a communist or a capitalist? I say no. Not communist, not capitalist, not socialist. Then what the hell is he? Everywhere I go, whether it's meeting friends, lecturers, professors from London, New York, France, Germany, they ask me the same question. Why? Because all these students and professors in Paris, London, New York, America, they are trained to think from young, from student days like you guys when you're undergraduate. They train you to think only one way. They cannot see big picture. They only know, they only see the world through a certain analysis, certain perspective, certain lens. Understand? Your framework is very narrow. They cannot see that you can be pragmatic, you can be pragmatism. In fact, Lee Kuan Yew is the first leader in the world, post-colonial colonial leader, who supported multinational companies. If you guys in, in, in other countries don't want them, give it to me. So Singapore welcomes multinational companies, which are mostly Western companies. You know, Later on, we'll talk a little bit about them. And Lee Kuan Yew welcomed the multinational companies to Singapore with what? with low tax, cheap land, cheap labor, and, and pioneer status, sometimes zero tax, and cheap utility. So the multinationals come. Why? Because cheap, everything cheap, cheap workers, cheap land, cheap tax, right? Because they want to what? They want to maximize profit. You know what's multinational companies? The number one priority is profit maximization for their shareholders and welfare minimization for the stakeholders, right? That's how they squeeze profit and make money. That's why the stock market always go up for them. So, the multinationals come to Singapore. It's also for a good thing. The multinational companies, the MNCs, we call them, they make money. At the same time, they also help the country. Why? It's important. They give you jobs, right? And also, they bring in the latest technology, latest 
management techniques, latest distribution channel, latest marketing network, and blah, blah, blah. So that's why it's important for MNCs as well. And that's the reason I also have shared in my TV interview in Odisha, in Lviv, the same thing. All right? You cannot afford to be anti-MNCs. You have to welcome them, but how you manage the process of globalization, that is another story. All right? Maybe we have time, we can talk more later on, or during the TV interview this afternoon. I was told, is it 2 p.m., the TV interview, right? Yeah, maybe if you don't have time, you can see me on the TV interview. Professor will give you the TV link. Uh, that means I have to also f not forget to comb my hair, yeah? Remind me for the TV interview, okay? Now, so we have 7,000 multinational companies, 7,000 MNCs in Singapore, 4,000 operating headquarters, and 3,000 regional headquarters. Next. Next. Let's see how good you are. We talk about multinational companies like global brands. What is this? Wait, hang on, go back, go back. What is this? One by one. McDonald's. Of course, everybody knows. You have McDonald's here, I'm sure, right? Everywhere. Every corner in Singapore you see, everywhere in the world. Now, McDonald's is not just about physical consumption of hamburgers, you know. It's also a cultural con consumption. In fact, now, there's a whole thesis known as McDonaldization. In American campus, you can spend one whole semester study about McDonald, right? No joke. It's also about McDonaldization, standardization, rationalization, globalization, and all the rest of it. Okay, and how they destroy local culture as well. How many like McDonald? Oh, I don't like McDonald. <laughs> Seriously, McDonald is fast food. American fast food means junk food. I prefer Bosch. <laughs> I prefer Veroniki. Smachna. Next. What is this? Oh, you know that too. <laughs> they are the rival of another cola known as Coca-Cola, the, the Cola Wars. Very interesting. You are international business economy student. You should read about the Cola Wars. Very interesting. You know when, when they advertise this in France or Russia, they thought they will win. Because why? Because it's their national color. <laughs> so you feel patriotic, you should drink more Pepsi Cola. Right? Who was the famous ambassador? Pepsi Cola? Yeah. He's now singing and dancing in, 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 in heaven. What's his name? Beyonce. I'm not so sure. It used to be Michael Jackson. <laughs> you know where he is, right? Yeah. He's walking in the moon. Moonwalk. <laughs> yes. Who is this? Starbucks. Very interesting. Have you got Starbucks in Ukraine? Why is it that I go everywhere in Ukraine, all the students seem to know so well? You mean you can smell the coffee? <laughs> can you smell it? How do you guys know? There's a power of globalization, right? Before they even come to your country, you know everything. You know very interesting about Starbucks? We have Starbucks everywhere in Asia as well. Starbucks, you look at the logo, what do you see? Mermaid, right? Very interesting. At first, the first logo of Starbucks, the mermaid has short hair. Uh oh, guys, you cannot, you can imagine, right? Mermaid with short hair. Uh oh. So now they say no, no, the hair must be longer. You must cover up some vital part of your biology. Very interestingly, in Muslim countries. So in my business and lectures, I'm also visiting professor, not just to European universities. I'm also visiting professor to many Asian universities. Some are Muslim countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and now there's talk where they want to force this mermaid to cover up, you know? Doesn't look like a mermaid anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, and then they may have forced her to wear a bra also. Right now, no bra. So, you know, so Muslim country, you know, there are cultural implications, you know what I mean? So I'm saying that even in globalization, there are cultural implications. So these are some cultural issues for international economic students that you can think about. Next. This old man is KFC. No, he has no problem to cover up. He's fully covered up. He's safe. You have KFC, Ukraine? In Kiev. In Kiev, not here. Oh, if you want to eat chicken, you must go all the way to Kiev. Forget about chicken. Eat other things. A very interesting story. We'll come back to KFC later on. Next. Wow, girls. Gucci. Gucci. Oh my Gucci. Every time the girls, when they say they have a special, you know, attachment. Oh my Gucci. Next. Chanel. See, see? Chanel. 
<laughs> we guys say Gucci, can I? The girls say, oh, Gucci, Chanel. Passion, so much passion. You know something? They look very similar. Agree? Ah, that means to say they steal the ideas from each other. Copyright issue. C C G G. One is Gucci Giovanni, the other is Coco Chanel. I don't know who is who. If you ask me until today, I'm not sure who is who. They look the same. They might sue each other. So it shows that even in high fashion international brands, there is copying, stealing, even the logo. I heard that students of Kharkiv University is very rich. All of you wear Gucci, carry Chanel, perfume, or whatever, or Prada. Yes? You have Prada bag? You wear Prada? You wear a Prada, but you drive a Lada. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just joking. My apology. <laughs> okay. Anybody here? Wear a Prada, but drive a Lada. No? Okay, I'm sorry. Nothing wrong with Lada. Well, yeah, my friends in Russia, they are proud of the Lada, but I prefer my Ferrari, right? <laughs> anyway, sorry, yeah, let's go on. Uh, next one. Wow, there you are. You are all very rich, you come to school in Mercedes, right, Professor? You see? I come to school in tram, train, but you come to school in Mercedes. Or Lada, whatever. <laughs> next. You know, ah, again, Guys, can you see? Very similar. So who steal who? The Japanese stole from the Germans, right? So after the war in the 50s and 60s, when the Japanese technology were about to take off 50 years ago, all the countries in the West, in America, condemned Japan for copycat. They steal technology, they steal ideas, they even steal the logo. Sorry, no offense. Any Japanese here? Now, when I say things, I don't mean to offend your culture or country. I'm just stating academic facts. Okay, so I beg your pardon. I'm just a visiting professor. I'm telling you the facts. So don't get offended. I even make joke of my own country. We have to be truthful. We're all adults, right? I cannot be kidding you. When I say you wear a Prada, you drive a Lada. Don't get me wrong. Okay, madam. I'm sure you drive a Ferrari. <laughs> so coming back here. When the Japanese economy took off, they copied the technology. They copied even the Paddy logo. Can you believe it? Yeah. Right? My father used to have a Toyota. Toyota in the 1960s. And all the neighborhood kids, they were scratching his car. He was very angry with all the neighborhood kids. You know why? They were looking for Coca-Cola can. No joke. At the time, people believed that Japanese cars were made from Coca-Cola can. <laughs> so cheap. And that was the, the perception. All right, so in the 1970s and 80s, when Korean companies like Hyundai, Samsung, LG took off, they also copied from the Japanese and Western companies, and everybody condemned the Koreans. And today, the Korean technology is really good, right? How many of you got Samsung? I'm sure your Galaxy Note, everything, right? So the Korean technology has taken off. And now, and now China is trying to take off technology, everybody is condemning China for copycat as well. So next time, Ukraine, Take off, people will condemn you for copycat as well. So one nation copy another. It's a cycle of life. Nothing new. Don't forget, last time, who invented printing? Who invented compass? Who invented navigation? Who invented gunpowder and all the navigation and all that? It's the China, right? <laughs> so Western nations copy them as well. So Marco Polo, remember? You go and read about them. So no, it's the old silk road. So one nation copy another. Why well, is nothing new? It goes on all the time. Next. This is what does it stand for? Life is good. Alright? LG, Korean company. Next. Ah. This is the first the, the company that the first company to invent your dog matrix printer, laser printer, oil printers, very powerful, yeah? Uh, in one university in Ukraine, I don't want the name. One student said, so I know. Okay. What does it stand for? HP stands for Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Too much Hollywood, yeah? Next. This is. Well, how come you know? Do you have one way telephone here? I, I was very surprised. Last week, um, the week before last, I was in Helsinki. You know where Helsinki? Yeah. I was also giving lectures Helsinki to Finland. So many of my students 
some young professors, they carry Huawei telephone. They carry Xiaomi telephone. Do you have those telephones here? And I was surprised because in Singapore, we don't have that many. We have some, but not many. In my class, almost 30%, 30 to 40% of my students have Huawei and Xiaomi telephone. And I said, why is it that you guys like Xiaomi and Huawei so much? I said, so, they are so cheap and so good. I said, how good is it compared to your Apple? They said, almost as good. But Apple 8, Apple 8 just came out, right? Last week? Wow, you guys are all carrying Apple 8, yeah? Wow, lucky fellas. How good is Apple 8? It's pretty good, yeah? Except that, the, you know what happened now, right? When you charge too much, the thing is swollen up. You know the problem, yeah? Some of the phones now, Apple 8. So the Xiaomi and, and Huawei is not 100% is good, but it's almost 80%, 90%. But the price is only one third, $300. Xiaomi, the, the Xiaomi is 300 Whereas your Apple 8 is about 1200 Four times more expensive, only slightly better. So you think about it. What's the utility that you're an economic student, right? You're paying 400% more, but you're getting maybe 10% extra value. So it's worth it. So that is a question you need to ask. But of course, Apple has got, you know, like somebody wearing Prada, you know. <laughs> Apple has got this, you know what I mean? Yeah. Next. Now, this is interesting. Alibaba. You know who? Alibaba, yes. The biggest online retail company in the world, bigger than even Amazon or eBay. Right? And getting bigger every day. Who's the chairman? Founder? Yeah. And Jack Ma. Yoda looking guy, short guy, smart brains. Now he very interestingly, let's remember I told you about the KFC story, Kentucky story. In Hangzhou, China, where Jack Ma was, when he was uh, dropped out, he was young and out of luck. He applied for a job. Twenty-four people applied for a job to work in KFC. Twenty-three was accepted. Only one was rejected, and he was Jack Ma. Thank you, KFC. <laughs> I tell this story every time to you guys because I know as students you will have your ups and downs. Especially, what year are you? First year? Third year? Third year, going to graduate next year, right? So I know you'll be uh, desperately applying, hunting for jobs, and out of 100 applications, sometimes 99 come back rejected. I know the feeling, I've gone through that before. It's no fun. You know, roller coaster. So, I tell this story to help to inspire you, to give you positive feelings so that you remember the story of Jack Ma. Out of 24 employees, KFC, he was the only one rejected. And today he's a, probably the richest man in China, worth about 20 billion. So you can be Jack Ma too, next time. Remember? Next. Uh, GDP per capita, let's come back to some economic uh, facts here, as you can see. Richest country, Qatar. Next, Luxembourg. Next, Singapore, Brunei, Kuwait, Norway, United Arab, Samaro, Switzerland, blah, blah, blah. Saudi Arabia. Now, this is very interesting. Singapore is number three. Most of the other top ten are what? Qatar, Kuwait, Brunei, Norway, Arab. They are rich, oil-rich producing countries. So all they have to do is just turn on the tap. Money will flow into their pocket. In Singapore, not so lucky. We have to work very hard. Okay? I will come back to that story later on. Next. So this is our first Prime Minister, 50 years ago at Independence. Next. And as you can see, um, he was in his 80s from third world to first world. 50 years ago, Singapore was very poor, newly independent. We had lots of problems, social problems, housing problems, education problems, unemployment problems, blah, blah, blah. Lots of mafia running around too. That's why he was crying. Can you imagine? He was in tears at first. Now, when you announce your independence, you should be celebrating, you should be jumping, you should be dancing. Yes or no? But no, he was crying in tears because there were so many problems. Remember I said, we don't even have enough water. We have to buy water from neighbouring Malaysia. We were separated from Malaysia. We were literally kicked out from Malaysia because Singapore believed in multiculturalism. Singapore believed in multiracialism. We are colourblind. I don't care whether you are White, yellow, blue, black, brown, green, purple. We are all human beings. All right? It's enshrined in the National Pledge. Everybody, every student say that every day, regardless of race, language, religion. Singapore believes in meritocracy, multiculturalism. 
Malaysia believe in sometimes sadly one race, one language, one religion, and you know which one. Anyone from Malaysia here? No offense again. Yeah. So you know the story. So luckily, Singapore separated because of its policies, far thinking, positive, dynamic policies. Singapore became from third world to first world. At independence 50 years ago, Singapore poorer than some African states, no joke. When I said this on a TV interview in Odisha, the TV interviewer did not even believe me. No joke, are you sure you're serious? I said, yes, it's the truth, it's a fact, you can check it up. We are poorer than some African states. Today, as you can see, we are the top three richest nation. In fact, I'll tell you more, more secret. You want to be a millionaire? You want to be a millionaire? I'm sure you want to be. You come to this lecture, if you get one idea, that is the most powerful idea. All right? You may not want to stay in Kharkiv anymore. Go to your house. You want to be a millionaire, right? I'll tell you more. You want to know, right? Stay until the end. I'll tell you more. Next. Next. Some of the important policies of Lee Kuan Yew, because Singapore is so small, we have no resources. As I said, we don't even have enough land for banana, no water, no nothing. Therefore, the only resource is our human beings, human resource. We must maximize human resource. That means brain power. Therefore, education, training, investment is very important. We must have an open economy because we have a very small domestic. Remember, I said coming back again and again, we say what well, Singapore is so small, our buildings must be so tall. Got it? Singapore is so small, our buildings must be so tall. No choice. So we have to maximize. And therefore, our economy, policy, everything depends on that. And we have to constantly upgrade our economy starting from, as I said at the beginning, we start from low pay, low skill, low tech, low value. And gradually, over the years, from low pay, low skill, low tech, to high pay, high skill, high tech. Okay? Today, a university graduate in Singapore. Any one of you, 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 you graduate next year, starting pay, 3,000 US dollar. Is that enough? No. Not enough. He said, <laughs> wow, what you want, 10,000? 3,000, starting pay, just undergraduate. I'm not talking about professor. Professor, sorry, I can't tell you, because if I tell you, tomorrow <laughs> professor won't be here. You go to Singapore, you have no more professors left. <laughs> We'll, we'll, tell, we'll talk over lunch. <laughs> okay, there you are. From low pay, low skill, low tech, to high pay, high skill, high tech. Next. Next, meritocracy, multiculturalism. We talked about that before. Major investment, infrastructure, global connectivity, transshipment, logistics, national stakeholders. I'll be talking about some of these public administration things. Uh, tomorrow, I'll focus more in the, in the institute, but today, I'll just touch on it quickly. Zero tolerance for corruption. Corruption is a big issue <clears throat> in many countries. I won't say where, but you know. So we talk a little bit later. Next. Uh, are you keeping time for me? Wait, hang on. Where's my phone? This is my phone, yeah? Okay. 11.50. We have one more hour, yeah? Okay, thank you. Uh, next. This is an important slide. It tells you everything that you want to know about Singapore. Uh, can you see? Can you see for yourself? Starting in the 1960s. Alright, can you see there? First, you have labor intensive. Labor intensive means. Sorry. Ah, oh, you okay? Right. So, labor intensive means workers, low pay, low skill, low tech. And then later on, you move on to skill intensive, higher skill, and then capital intensive, and then technology intensive, and today you have the knowledge based economy, right? Step by step. The red dots, um, where is my, for some reason, the pointer? Okay, never mind. Uh, ah, that one. Thank you. Now, if I may show you, thank you, this one. You see the red dot, the red circle? These are the recession years, so a slight dip. But on the whole, you can see it go higher and higher. Right? Higher and higher. Next. Here it shows you that sectoral percentage has grown smaller, but the value output has grown bigger. That means there's no more higher value added. Next. Uh, the education achievement in Singapore in the recent PISA conducted by OECD in Paris. 
Singapore has ranked number one for both science, reading, mathematics. This is an international school comparison test. As you can see, Singapore, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, Japan, China, Korea. Most of the East Asian countries are among the top five or top ten. Finland is also not bad. You can see Finland here, top five. Estonia for some reason. Uh, mathematics, uh, brrr, all East Asian countries. Estonia again. Finland, top five, top ten. I was in Finland last week. I visited some of the schools also to, to discuss and to find out more. I like the Finland model. Actually, in a way, better because Singapore, although it's ranked number one, is a pressure cooker system. You know what's pressure cooker? It's scary. Um, every year, not just Singapore, throughout East Asia, every year students commit suicide. You know, do you have students committing suicide here? In, in, in Ukraine? Yeah. Yeah. Because in, in Singapore, in East Asia, uh, our buildings are very tall. You know, they just jump up and bye bye. In Ukraine, your buildings are like this, so you're very safe. One thing good, yeah? Next. See? Our mathematics and other, even for the primary school, they are also ranked number one. As you can see, all their top four, top five are East Asian, except with Slovenia here and Russia here. Yeah. Next. For universities, next. Uh, as, as you expect, this is a QS international ranking. Number one is MIT, America, Harvard, Cambridge, Stanford, Oxford, you know, blah, blah, blah. And in Princeton, Singapore is number 12, National University of Singapore, number 13, Nanyang Technology, blah, blah, blah. So number 12, 13 in the world. Mm, not so bad. Not the best, but not so bad, right? Yeah. In Asia, we are ranked number one and two. Next. Uh, for World Competitive Service Report, we are ranked number two behind Switzerland, but ahead of USA. Next. Uh, for total trade percentage, Singapore behind Hong Kong, 300 over percent. That's why I said we are high beta economy compared to even China and US, which is less than 50 percent. Next. Uh, ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries, we are 300 billion dollar economy, similar to Malaysia and Philippines, but the giant is Indonesia, 800 over billion, touching 1 trillion soon. Because Indonesia has a population of about 300 million. All right, it's a rapidly growing consumer middle class. It's a lot of potential, as well as Vietnam as well. Vietnam is also going very, very fast. I just met your vice rector in the office and was telling us about, you know, the Vietnamese economy too. Next. Uh, next. Uh, best investment potential, Singapore is number one in the world, next. Uh, doing business as well, number one, next. Trade, foreign trade investment, number three, yes, next. Uh, most network ready, number two, behind Sweden and Finland. Uh, in terms of internet speed, I'm sure you guys want to know, right? All the students want to know about internet speed. We have the fastest internet broadband speed in the world, faster than even Japan and USA. Uh, next. Intellectual property protection, we are number two in the world behind Finland. Okay, uh, now intellectual property is a big, big thing in Singapore. It's very serious. The law is very strict. Um, you know, like you guys, when you study, you go to a library or you go to a bookshop, you get a book. Can you go to the shop and photocopy the book? No problem, right? If you want to photocopy, you go to any shop, no problem, right? But in Singapore, you do that, you go to jail. I'm not joking, you go to jail. So every year I tell my students, first day at school, I warn them. I said, don't go and photocopy the whole book because you will go to jail. So what I told them to do, I said, okay, there are 10 chapters, right, in your book. So all three, all 10 of you, you go, each one photocopy one chapter. And then after that, you go and share among yourself. And that's okay. All right? But you photocopy whole book by yourself, you go to jail. Very strict. Same thing. Some people, they like to download songs, Taylor Swift, or whatever. Who's the hottest? Uh, what's the latest song on the internet? Huh? What is that, that song that was banned in Malaysia? Remember that song? Spacito? Despacito or Desperado, whatever. Okay. So you guys download Despacito from the, from the internet. 
In Singapore, you do that, you will be a desperado because they send you to jail. No well, joke. They will de detect this. Oh, there are ways. I mean, if you download once or twice, they will just close one eye. But if you download many times and you distribute around, they know they will send you to jail. Okay. And if you go to many cities in the world, you go to the night market in Bangkok, in Jakarta, Saigon, you can hear Michael Jackson every night. Yes, Michael Jackson is still singing every night on the streets of, of Bangkok, Jakarta, you know, Saigon, but not in Singapore. Why? Because it's very strict, it's banned. You cannot buy pirated CD. You know pirated CD? No pirate CD in Singapore. It means CDs are very expensive. And, uh, you know, but, but in this country, I heard you guys download everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah, yeah. What, you watch King Kong? King Kong movie? Yeah. yeah. Or Kung Fu Panda? Yeah. yeah, how? No need to go cinema, save money, watch at home, download YouTube, everything for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. You guys want to watch Kung Fu Panda, King Kong, Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, Iron Man, go to her house. <laughs> she has everything. All right? Iron Man. Batman, Spider-Man, who you like? Uh, Iron Man. Really? <laughs> I prefer Iron Lady. Well. Okay, next. There you are, more global innovation in the world, Singapore. Ah, well, this one, um, I will talk more about this, this, this chart. Sometimes, although these are big time professors, experts in US, UK, London, I don't agree with them. I think there's something wrong with this. I will discuss later, next. Um, Easiest place to do business in the world, Singapore again, next. World logistics, number one, Singapore again, as you can see, next. Uh -huh. uh, this is interesting. This is about the fourth industrial revolution. You heard about the fourth industrial revolution? It's exciting, but it's scary. The fourth industrial revolution is coming. You can run, but you cannot hide is coming, is going, first is going to, I'm talking about things like, even, even I give you an example, every time I come to Kiev, I would take the taxi from Borispol airport to my hotel, I like to stay in Maidan, in Ukraine hotel in Maidan, you know Ukraine hotel you've been, it's an old hotel but it's very interesting because you know, it's very good. The location is right at Maidan, Kashatik Avenue. From my room, I can see the whole of Maidan. They always give me a high floor because they know I'm the visiting professor from Singapore. They give me a very good room, high floor, everything. And um, um, from the taxi, from the airport to, to Maidan, cost 500 grivna, 500. Just last week, I took the Uber. You know Uber? You have Uber here in Kharkiv? Yeah. Uber cost me 250, half the price. You get me now? So there you are. This is an example of fourth industrial revolution. What is Uber? Uber is not a taxi company. Uber is not a transport company. Uber is a technology company. Right? The business is the same. The business is about making money, profit generating bottom line. But the model has changed. It's now a technology company. Agree? It's not just I travel around the world. It's not just Ukraine or, 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 or Bangkok or Jakarta or Paris or London or Germany or Warsaw. Everywhere I go. Except Moscow, they use Yandex, they don't allow Uber. So there you are. Uber is an example of the kind of fourth industrial revolution we are talking about. And also it shows how globalization has changed because different countries respond differently. Example, in, in, in many countries, in Singapore, we welcome Uber, but in London, they're going to cancel the, less, the license soon. You know the problem, right? They're going to cancel the license of Uber because of uh, safety record. In Hong Kong, the police in plain clothes would jump into the car, Uber, and grab the Uber driver and throw him in jail. It's illegal in Hong Kong. So you see, even for that, you see how countries respond to globalization, respond to the forces of the industrial revolution. So Uber is just one example. I can tell you, give them another three to five years. Right now, you know what happened, right? On the streets of London, Bangkok, LA, Paris, the, the, the taxi drivers are fighting with the Uber drivers. Why? Because they're stealing the jobs away. Who would pay 500 grief now when you can pay half the price? Agree? Life is about maximizing economic value. You're economic students, right? You must max maximize economic value. I know it's bad news for the taxi drivers, but hey, man, I got to maximize my economic value. You go to where it gives, it gives you the best value, the cheapest as possible. So this is just one example. But in three to five years, you have driverless car. You know that, right? 
already that piloted in the US that started the system. So in three to five years, they predict that all your taxi drivers, your Uber drivers, your bus drivers, your truck drivers will be out of job, thanks to technology again. In fact, many of your jobs, like your lawyer even, your architects, your accountants, they will also be out of jobs because of robots coming. You know that, right? Robots are coming. In fact, in, um, in, in Texas, in America, they have already started using drones to deliver pizza. You know that? Drones. They come to your house, sing a song, you come out, get your pizza, smile, one picture, you don't even have to bother to sign. Okay? And there you are. And next time, they're going to have your eyeball recognition. You don't even have to use your credit, credit card to swipe. You come out, you smile, they take a picture, zoop, your eyeball. They recognize your eye pattern, your retina pattern. It's even better than your fingerprint, according to one of my friends. All right? He's a professor of cybersecurity and all that. He told me that the, the eyeball retina recognition is 1,000 times safer than your fingerprint. Because fingerprint, there's still a chance where it's about 90, 98%, but retina is almost 100%. Unless you go and grab his eyeball, you put zoom, and zoom, you know. So be careful. Some people might steal your eyeball. <laughs> I'm not joking. In India, I was told, anybody from India here? Are you from India? I was told, I don't know how true. Again, no offense. Uh, we have many Indians, have many good Indian friends. He told me that his great grandfather, he worked for the British Civil Service more than 100 years ago. He was dead and still claiming pension payment. Pension payment. You know it's pension, right? You work for the civil service, used to be the British Civil Service. And then, after you retire, every month you go to the government office, you can get $100 or $200. Wow, for life, forever. I said, how can it be? Your grandfather has passed away almost 100 old years. Oh, well, then when, before we bury him or burn him, we cut off his thumb. So every day, my mother go to the post office, we just use his, take his thumb and get money. Very useful. So be careful, they may take out your eyeball next time. Or whatever, whichever part of the body. Alright, so very useful. And when you guys, you go shower, you run out of shampoo, you make a call, the drones will come to your bathroom, deliver your shampoo. And then tomorrow, you'll be internet celebrity. <laughs> so remember to wrap up first. Okay? These, these are the security implications of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, very scary because Deep Blue, the IBM machine has beaten Gary Kasparov in 1996. Right? So far back. And last year, AlphaGo, the machine, has beaten Lee Sado, the Korean champion. Go is supposed to be a complex chess game, far more complex than your, than your international chess. And this year, AlphaGo 2 has beaten the Chinese champion, which is the international Go champion. It shows the machine has now overtaken human computing power. So it is coming. Fourth Industrial Revolution. Robot is coming. First, they will eat your job. After that, they will eat you. <laughs> scary. Exciting, but scary. All right? And don't forget machines, you know, robots. They do not eat, they do not sleep, and they do not shit. They learn, they keep on learning, getting better and better. So if you look at this, fourth industrial revolution, they say Singapore is ranked number two behind Switzerland. I do not agree. Why? Although Singapore is not bad, I don't think they can be better than here. Can you see? Japan and Germany. These two are champions. They are giants in robotic technology. So I'm... <laughs> I do not agree that Singapore is ranked so highly. It can never be better than in Japan. These are world leaders, robotic technology. So I'm afraid, although this chart comes from the World Economic Forum with all the big, big professors and experts, I'm afraid sometimes experts can be wrong. Okay, I come from Singapore, I can tell you. We are not bad, but I don't think it can ever be better. Even for that matter, Hong Kong, Norway, Denmark, New Zealand, Sweden, they can never be ahead of Japan and Germany. These two countries should be number one, in fact. Sometimes I don't know what metrics they use. All right, this is a lesson for ranking. Next. Yeah. Wow, Prada watch. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Next. Uh, okay, Singapore dollar. Singapore dollar is the strongest currency in Asia. Right. Uh, ouch. All right. Uh, good and bad. Good and bad. Because if you have a strong currency, it's good for your what? Good for investment. Right. And also as a, what? As an international financial center, you need to have a strong currency stability, right? So bad, why bad? Why? Why bad? Tell me. There is still less money when you're exporting. Exporting, yes, very good. Bad for export because 
competitiveness, you know, your currency competitiveness is very weak. That's why the Japanese print a lot of money, you know, economics. Why? To devalue the yen, the Japanese yen, to subsidize the exports, because they export a lot, Toyota, Yamaha, Toshiba, and so on. So, strong currency, bad for exports. Uh, and vice versa. And also another thing bad is tourism. Right? Foreign tourists will not come because the currency is too strong. Alright? So the other reverse of it is Ukraine. I was talking about it uh, in the last TV interview in Lviv. They were asking me about the bad effects of the Krishna. The Krishna is ranked probably, I think, the second cheapest currency in the world now, next to the Malaysian ringgit. And then everybody is saying, oh, so bad. So bad, Ukrainian grief not so bad, so low. I said, hey, hang on, it's not so bad. The TV interview was very surprised. What? You mean good? I said, they are good points. Remember the yin and yang story again? Alright, they're good and bad and everything. Why good? Because if the grief now is cheap, that means you can attract a lot of foreign direct investment. That means you can invite a lot of foreign tourism. And foreign tourism is a good thing. I give an example. I was telling you I stay in Ukraine or Kevin Mayer. At first, three years ago, I only have to pay. Thirty dollars. This time, I have to pay sixty dollars, seventy dollars. Gone up hundred percent. Why? Foreign tourism. All right, tourism is rebounding. Economy is rebounding, and tourism is very good multiplier, positive multiplier effect for what your transport industry, your your beverage industry, your restaurant industry, your taxi company, and all that. Right. So there are good points as well. So you have to position yourself in your jobs which sector you want to be. You want to take advantage of the low Krishna. So you do not want to work in outbound tourism. You have to work in the inbound tourism. You know what's outbound and inbound, right? You do not want to work for import companies. You have to work for export company. You see the difference now? So it's not all bad. It depends on how you strategize yourself, how you leverage yourself, how you position yourself. Not everything is bad. Because I know when you talk about Krishna, low Krishna, bad, 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 you must think also about the good, good, good. Okay? And, and the good thing is about, you know, you have, uh, if I have chance, I will show you later on. You know McDonald's? The McDonald's index? The Big Mac index? As I said, Krishna is probably the second cheapest currency in the world. Everywhere I go, I make it a point to visit McDonald's. Not because I like McDonald's, because I want to see the prices as an international comparison. One Big Mac in Ukraine, how much? 60 Grifna, right? Yeah. About 60 Grifna, 60, 65, right? If you go to Finland, Helsinki, it costs 65 Grifna is only about $2 US, $2.50, something less than 3. If I go to Helsinki, it costs $8 US. Singapore, $6.50. Okay, Beijing is about 5 alright? Ukraine, two fifty. Wow, you see what I mean? So the Big Mac, McDonald's is very good comparison to say that your Krista is indeed undervalued. Right? So eat more McDonald's. <laughs> Next. Now, currency, the strong currency has got a very serious political lesson. <clears throat> you are an international economic student. Why I show you this chart? This is what happened to Indonesia back in the Asian financial crisis. Who remember? What year was it? Yes? 1998. Well done. Smart deal, yeah? 1998. 97, 98. What happened in the Indonesian financial crisis holds very important policy lessons for all of us. They started at the beginning, 97. One US dollar, 5,000 rupiah. Indonesian rupiah. What happened was international speculators attacked the currency. So it started off as a currency crisis or financial crisis. But because the officials, the government officers, the professors, they do not know how to handle the problem. They are not experienced enough. They don't have the required knowledge. So they screw up the job. And very soon, the rupiah crashed overnight, almost overnight, from $1.5,000 rupiah to $1.20,000 rupiah. 25,000 rupiah crashed 4 to 5 hundred percent. And you believe it? Almost overnight. So, what happened is that from a financial crisis, it became into an economic crisis because imagine if you have a family, okay, 
if you have a family, you have to feed so many mouths at home. Your mouth, your wife, and your children. Let's say you have how many kids at home? How many kids do you have? One kid. Only one kid? He's very productive. He started his machinery. What about you? How many you have? How many you have? How many wife? How many children you have at home? None. Who are you waiting for? Okay, I'm joking. But anyway, coming back to Indonesia. Indonesia, don't forget, Indonesia problem is made worse, the economic problem is made worse by their cultural factors because Indonesia, remember I told you, is 300 million people and the largest Muslim population in the world. Muslims can have how many wives? Not so many, not five. <laughs> I don't know where you get it from. Maximum four. Muslim men. Four wives. Each wife, let's say, four kids. Yeah. So all together, there are 20 mouths to feed. Can you imagine? 20 mouths to feed. And with the economic crisis, the, 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 the cost of your rice, of your bread go up 500%. Where you got money to buy, to feed 20 mouths? Right? So I know girls may be asking, why the man so stupid? Why marry four wives? How many do you want? No one. You sure? Are you sure? Or you're afraid the professor is <laughs> How many you want? Like one is enough. One is more than enough. Very smart man, yeah? How many you want? Yeah? Where are you from? I'm from Harkin. Sorry? I'm from Harkin. Harkin. Yes. Anybody from Central Asia? Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan? I was told by my students from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, they can have four wives too, right? Muslim. So, imagine 20 miles to feed. It's a big problem. Right? So, that it shows that cultural factors complicate economic problems. And then the economic problem, they went out of control, so everybody, no job, the whole society chaos, no law and order, fighting, looting, killing, okay, and then very soon it became a political crisis. So, from currency crisis to financial crisis to economic crisis, finally political crisis, and then become military crisis. So you can see how the problem get worse and worse, bigger and bigger, and finally, the president himself collapsed. The government collapsed. The, final, the president downfall, so after downfall. I know that was 20 years ago, 1997. Uh, you cannot go back to 27, uh, 20 years ago, but I will bring it back to you. Because I remember clearly, it was during the first ASEAN University conference. I was presenting my paper, conference paper in the hotel. Outside my window, there were rioting, looting, killing, fighting. Next. I'll bring it to Indonesia. Can you see? Next. Can you see? Next. And then the downfall of? Next. Oh, this is President Suharto. You can see people go for free shopping. Yeah? Free shopping. Don't try it. This is called looting. The police will be shooting you. It's illegal. Yeah? But I don't blame them. Because when you have 20 miles to feed at home, you have no choice. Right? So it's very serious. The whole economy, society collapsed. It's scary. Uh, we were attacked in the hotel. Our conference had to be cut short, and we were escorted by police to the airport and rushed back, flew back to Singapore to, for safety. Otherwise, today I would be sending it. So, the policy lessons of the crisis in Indonesia holds a lot of lessons for developing countries like Ukraine. Okay, because IMF came in to try to inject money to stabilize and rescue the situation, but in fact, IMF. International Monetary Fund. They made it worse. And this guy, Joseph Stiglitz, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, my hero here, all right, Nobel Prize winner, economist. He was chief economist of World Bank. He criticized IMF. Why? IMF injected 20 billion into the Indonesian economy. But conditions, many conditions, A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z. All right, just like what IMF did five years ago, six years ago in Greece, in Italy, remember? Greece had a, some, something similar, very similar. But luckily, no total collapse yet. They also started with financial crisis, economic crisis, and political crisis, and Sipari's government stepped in. But luckily, it did not go down further. And they also imposed very strict IMF conditions, like cut your pension, cut your welfare, cut your payment, but increase your tax. My friends in Athens were telling me, they're crazy, they're crazy. You cut my payment, I know money, how to, how to give tax, how to pay tax. You know what I mean? So, 
Joseph Stiglitz was criticizing IMF and he called IMF Dracula. You know Dracula? They call IMF this one because Indonesia was collapsing. Dying man. It's a dying man, a sick man lying on a hospital bed. Dracula come and what? Suck his blood. So what happened to the dying man? Dead. This is what happened to Indonesia. Got it? Now this, as I said, whole powerful lessons for Ukraine. Because Ukraine is also getting money from IMF. Very powerful. Tomorrow, especially for the governors, it's very important policy lessons. But luckily, luckily, because of criticism from Joseph Stiglitz, IMF has got internal reform. Now they're making it a little bit easier. Maybe too, too easy for Ukraine, I don't know. Because when they give money, they have to hold the country accountable. That means to say, I give you 10 billion. You must do a, B, C. Maybe no need X, Y, Z. Yeah? A, B, C first. You must hold them accountable so that they can reform. If not, they will just take the money and then they go and drink vodka. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or buy Prada or Lada or whatever. You follow me? Okay, we come to that later. So why I talk about Indonesian crisis? Because of very important policy lessons. Not just from the Singapore angle. And they are next to Singapore. They are the biggest guy in ASEAN. What happened to them in Taiwaners? Next. Next. Now this chart is a very, very powerful chart. Can I off the light here so that you can see better from the back? Which light is it? For the first two, I believe. No? No? Um, which light? Oh, you know the switches for this row, right? No, they are not controlled. Where is the switch? Can you all see the, the, the slides from the eye? Because this light makes it a bit hard for them to see. You try to figure out, maybe this two or this two? Ah, this two, yeah, got it. I think it's better now, right? Why? It's the most important chart. It's about the corruption index in the world. Can you see guys in the back? Show me. Wow, well done. You are all anti-corruption watchers. See carefully. Okay. Number one, tell me, guys in the back. Denmark, you've got very powerful eyes. Next. New Zealand next. Singapore. Top one. Two, three, all top, yeah? And then, after that, we have Australia, Canada, Japan, US. US doing something. Not that good, yeah? But okay. China, India, Pakistan, Russia, Somalia. Oh, good news. Ukraine is not here. <laughs> no corruption. Perfect, perfect, yeah? Now, tell me. Denmark, New Zealand, Singapore. Why are they number one? They never get bribed. You sure? Are you sure about that? Why are they number one? Three countries. What is common about the three countries? Tell me. What is common about all the three countries? They are all very, small. very small. So my question to you, my question, does it mean that all small countries are very clean? No. Yes or no? I travel around the world, I can tell you. Some of the countries, small countries, are being too are hopelessly corrupted. So, size is a supporting factor. Yes, it does help. Supporting factor. Easy to govern, easy to run. But it is not a determining factor. Understand? Supporting, yes, but not determining factor. So, there are many other determining factors. Important. Like, example, your rector wants me to talk especially about corruption. That's why I especially focus more on this. So what, especially tomorrow again. Um, so can, tell me, what are the important factors to combat corruption? High salaries. Wow, of course. Yeah. Professor want more salary. Understand, thank you. <laughs> yes, it's a good point. High salaries. And more? Any more? Very important, you have? Standards of living. Hmm? Standards of living. Standards of living. Standards of living, okay, yes, yes. Connected with salary, yes. And also institutional. The institutional value, the institutional system is very, very important. We'll come to that later. Huh? 
You see, if you say size is the most important factor, then let me ask you the question. Okay? If size is the most important factor, then why? Right? Why is it that Canada, Australia, they are very big giant? Why are they so clean? Right? Top 10, very good. Why? Pachimu. Population. So? So it's not the size of the country, right? And other reasons like institutional systems and values. Okay? Next. So in Singapore, we have zero tolerance for corruption. Zero tolerance. That means if you steal, I don't care whether you steal one million dollar or even one dollar. You go jail. Okay? Now this pillar represents the, the, the reasons for it. We have effective laws, independent judiciary, effective enforcement, responsive public service, and of course the underlying political view from the government and the people. Very, very important. In fact, I can tell you a, a personal story. In 1986, the Housing Minister of Singapore, Housing Minister, you know, remember we said Singapore is so small, right? Buildings are so tall, and the buildings and the houses are very expensive. How much does a house cost him? One house, say, three bedroom, nice house with garage and garden. 50,000, really? Uh, good area. Not five star, but four star, I say. 50,000? 50, for a house? The garden? A flat apartment in the city? Yeah. Two room? Yeah. One room? Two room? Holy cow. <laughs> I don't want to go back to Singapore. I want to stay here forever. I can sell my Singapore house, I can buy 10, 20 apartments and be comfortably. You know, in Singapore, for that flat, easily one million US dollar. Easily more than one million US dollar. I can sell my flat and come here. <laughs> Enjoy my life in Karki. Now, and buy my Prada and Lada. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now, uh, guys, so the housing minister of Singapore, you can imagine how much money, yeah? Houses are so expensive. So he was caught for corruption. Wow, corruption. He was caught for corruption by the CPIB. CPIB is a Central uh, Corruption Practices Investigation Bureau. It's an independent wing, different from even the police. Independent, because police can be corrupted. But this is not corrupted. This reports directly to the Prime Minister. And so, he called the Kuan Yu, Prime Minister, because they were good friends, they were classmates for many years. He said, hey, Kuan Yu, help me, you know. They are investigating me for corruption. You know what Ikuan Yu told him? Hey buddy, sorry mate, you go jail. I'm not going to help you. They have been friends, schoolmates for 50 years. And yet Ikuan Yu said no help. So in the end what happened to the minister? He <coughs> hanged himself. Of course the government said he, you know, he taken too much sleeping pill, overdose on sleeping pill. But this is just a politically correct statement. You know what I mean? My friend, my friend told me he hanged himself. So you see how strict Lee Kuan Yew is. So some people say that Lee Kuan Yew is no good because he didn't bother to help his good friend for so many years. Some people say Lee Kuan Yew was cold-hearted, hard-hated, tight-fisted. Tell me, guys, tell me, did Lee Kuan Yew do the right thing? Who agree? Only a few. Who said he did the wrong thing? Who said he did the wrong thing? Nobody said he did the wrong thing. Are you sure all of you agree with what Lee Kuan Yew did? Would you have done the same thing? If you were Lee Kuan Yew, would you have done the same thing? Tell me. Yes or no? Would you? Yes? You sure? Yes. And your brain says yes. It's wrong to corruption. I will do. Yes, I will do. But your heart says, no, he's my good friend. 50 years, my good friend. You know, heart and the brain sometimes they also fight, 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 you know? Yes, girls, you know what I mean. When the girls go shopping, they see a restaurant, nice chocolate cake. They say, ooh, ooh. The heart says, I love the cake. And then the brain says, no, 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 otherwise you cannot wear that sexy dress. Girls go to that all the time. Yeah, guys, we don't have the problem. We eat what we like. Eh? <laughs> we eat all the time. Okay. Anyway, you know what I mean? So, it is right or wrong. If you only want you, 
Would you have done the same thing? Would you have done the same thing? I know some people, a lot of people condemn Lee Kuan Yew for being strict, for having no emotional feelings and so on, but you must think, if you were the leader, if you were president, is Lee Kuan Yew doing this for his short-term personal good? Short-term personal interest? Or is it for the long-term national interest? Uh, that is a balance. That is a question you have to ask yourself. Whether right or wrong, you have to ask yourself. Is he doing it for the short-term personal interest or the long-term national interest? That is the question, right? So you decide. So that is a very important message for corruption. I spend so much time talking about corruption because your rector on the telephone talk about corruption. Tell my students about it. So that you all know very well. You want to know? You want to know more about corruption? So you'll be all empty corruption. And I hope and pray your government will be free of corruption because Ukraine is not on a chance, so we are very clean, I hope. Okay, next. Now, yes, any question? Yes, any question? How many years did it take here? How many? The corruption. How many years did it take? How many years did it take for Singapore to, to, to combat, to overcome corruption? Yes. As I said, 20 years ago we were very poor, we had lots of problems, we even had lots of mafia, and, uh, you know, lots of corruption. And it took him about 20, 30 years. 20, 30 years. So, as I was saying on the television interview, corruption is not something you can do overnight. I know a lot of people in many, many countries, even these so called experts or professors in London, US, you know, they always say, oh, how to solve corruption? Easy. Just increase the jail sentence from maybe one year to 10 years, or increase the fine from 1,000 Krishna to 1 million Krishna. Rock! I think you're a big professor, five-star professor of five-star universities, UK, US. The Singapore experience tell you it's wrong. You cannot do it overnight. Singapore's laws are very strict, but still, you cannot do it overnight. You cannot just depend on law and punishment. It's wrong. It's not enough. It's a wrong-headed approach. As I was saying on the television in TV, I was saying that, okay, if you get the case of Arabia, you know, many other Arab countries, they have very strict laws, as you know, right? You steal with your right hand, they chop your right hand. You steal with your left hand, they chop your left hand. You kick your, 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 your cat or with your leg, they chop off your leg. Right? So, everywhere you see, people with no hand, no leg in Arabia. You want that to happen to your country? But they will still, still, they will still go and steal criminal activity. So it's not just about punishment. Punishment is necessary, but it's not enough. You also need education. Understand to change the culture, the mentality, the people in society. Starting with even primary schools. So we have to teach our children since young to know that it is wrong to steal, it is wrong for corruption. So everybody know that to work hard for a living, work hard for a future, to have dignity, to have pride, to have confidence in themselves and in the society. So it is a generational thing. It takes a whole generation, 20, 30 years. All right? You cannot say, oh, I increase the tax, I increase the punishment, I increase the fine. And then you solve the problem. No. Alright? It's too simple-minded. Alright? So it's the whole package. Education is important. Society values is important. What I share with you, those things are important as well. Okay? Alright, any question? Alright, next please. Uh, hang on, back, back. Uh, mirror, can you see mirror, mirror on the wall? Who is the highest pay of them all? Who has the highest salary? Guess, tell me who. Next. You know this lovely guy? Yes. Wow, look at her. Yes, yeah, sure, I know him. What, you go on the phone with him every day or what? <laughs> he goes Twitter every morning, right? 5 a.m. he goes toilet. First thing, he tweet, 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 tweet. Twitter, when he's sitting on his toilet bowl. That's why American policy is a bloody mess now. Next. Who? Who is he? Naughty boy in Moscow. Yeah. I was saying that in uh, Singapore, we need to buy water from Malaysia, and sometimes Malaysia threatens to cut off our water supply. Right? Cut off our water supply, which is very serious. We have no more water to drink, no more water for shower. Imagine, only Kuan Yu, you know, in his shower, shampoo, everything, he go to the shower and he turn on, hey, no water, you want the shampoo on your head, you know. Frustrating, right? The same thing, one boy in Parachachaiko told me, my mother told me the same thing. I said, what? My mother told me that uh, one day she was cooking box in the kitchen and another boy in Moscow turned off the gas tank. <laughs> okay, you know who. Next, anyway. Who is he? Who is he? Anyone?
anyone from China here? Nobody in China? Anyone from Vietnam? Em khỏe không? Hmm? Em khỏe không? No? You're not from Vietnam? Are you from Vietnam? You know what's em khỏe không? I'm sure, right? You don't know? Okay, next. Xin chào Abi. That was the same thing. Xin chào Abi, Japan. Next. She just won an unprecedented, you know that last Sunday, she won the presidential, presidential election. Any German here? No one from Germany? But not so happy. You know why? A coalition government is going to have a big problem. Okay? We have time to talk about that. We can later. Next. Theresa May. I was talking about the Iron Lady of Britain. You know Iron Lady is who? Who knows? Wow, Margaret Thatcher, Iron Lady. Now, is she another Iron Lady? Well, we shall see. Now she's going to have Brexit negotiation going on. Exciting fireworks. Next. Who is it? Macron. France, right? President France. Now, uh, my friends from Paris, they don't call him Macron, they call him Macron. Maybe they don't want you to laugh at his name. Macron sounds like macaroni. <laughs> Next. Narendra Modi of India. Now all these are big powerful leaders of the world. So what is it? Who has the highest salary coming? Guess. You want to guess? You want to guess? Trump? Putin? Macaroni? Iron Lady? Merkel? Xi Jinping, China? Who? I'm sorry, you're all wrong. Next. There you are. Who is it? Lee Sien Loong of Singapore. 1.7 million dollars. US. More than even America, whether it's Barack Obama or Trump, it's just 400,000. And China, the biggest population is only 20,000 miserable. Unbelievable. Remember, Singapore is so small, and yet the salary is so big. <laughs> Does it make sense, right? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah. Singapore is 1.7 million. Singapore is the smallest country, and yet salary is the biggest of them all. Next. And you see the Prime Minister of Singapore is the son of Lee Kuan Yew now. Lee Kuan Yew passed away two years ago. So that's why, look at this guy, he's smiling at you. Of course, 1.7 million. <laughs> why not, right? So, I come back to what the professor was talking about. High salary. High salary. All the ministers, even junior ministers. One of my friends is a junior minister. In Singapore, his pay is also more than one million. All the professors' pay are very high. If I tell the professors tomorrow they all apply to Singapore, they have no more professors. Okay, teachers' pay also very high. Doctor, lawyer, policeman, all can pay very high. So yes, professor, one of the reason to combat corruption is through high pay. That's what Lee Kuan Yew said. Uh, as I said, Lee Kuan Yew died two years ago, so his son has won the election, and now he's a new Prime Minister. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew defended his policy, high ministerial pay policy in Parliament. He gave three reasons, three reasons why he must pay his government, his ministers, high pay. Number one, to combat corruption, because if you pay a ministers low, government low, to what happen? Not enough money, they have to look for other money. So temptation, temptation for corruption is very high. I don't want to name the countries, but I think you know what I'm talking about. I travel around the world, and some countries in Asia and Africa, even Latin America, all right, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Have you been to Cambodia? Phnom Penh. At the airport, Sambrit, Angkor Wat, the airport officer demand, demand, you have to show passport, right? At the airport, he demand for $5, five US dollars. Demand is give me money. Yeah. In Bali, that pass out. You know Bali, Indonesia? Yeah. 
He looked at my passport. He looked at my picture. He spent 20 minutes to admire my photo. I didn't know I was so handsome, you know. 20 minutes. In the end, my aeroplane, he knew, he's smart, he's experienced airport officer immigration. He knew, he knew there was nothing wrong, but he could keep me waiting. Because my aeroplane, my pilot cannot wait for me. So pay or don't pay, he's smarter. He did not open his mouth. He did not have to ask me. He just keep on admiring my picture. And the clock go pick, 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 pick. I look at the clock. And my sweat coming up. I said, no choice, I have to pay ten dollar US. He doesn't even have to open the mouth. I'm not teaching you bad ideas to do corruption. So that next time you become an officer, you can try these tricks. But these are what my personal experience. You cannot find in textbook, you cannot find from other professors, you cannot find from anywhere. But it's from my personal experience. The corruption, there are many ways to play the game. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, they don't even have to open the mouth. The guy's non pain stupid. Give me money. If I report him, he go, he go to jail. You know what I mean? This guy, he doesn't even have to open his mouth, he just admiring the photo. Mm -hmm. So nice, so nice. The crowd will tick, 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 and then he starts sweating. Your aeroplane is waiting. You can't say, hey, pilot, wait for me. Can you? Unless you're President Trump, you have your own private jet. Yeah, so you have to automatically pay. And it just say, terima kasih. Indonesia means thank you. So in Latin America, I want to say some more. There are also various ways, corruption. All right? You know, sometimes they don't have to give money because money you can trace easily, right? Sometimes they have to buy in China, for example, or in Vietnam, right? They buy expensive Prada, Gucci, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, and give them as presents. So they say it's not money, it's not corruption, it's present. Giving present is a corruption, tell me. Yes or no? Show me your hand. Who said that giving present is a form of corruption? It's a form of corruption if it worth more than a particular amount of money. Okay, now that's an interesting. More than a certain value. How do you define the value? How much? Hundred grand? Hundred US? In the amount of minimum uh, tax units. How much? Is there a law in your country? Then it will be like five dollars. Oh, yes. If you want something to receive for this present, it's a corruption. If you want something to something in return, you receive. Ah, uh, you give and then something in return. You see, in China, uh, anybody from China here? Again, I'm not talking bad about your country. Yeah. Uh, to be fair. Uh, since two years ago, President Xi Jinping has cracked down on corruption in a major way. He has sent a lot of government officers to jail. Tomorrow, Professor remind me to talk about that because I'm talking to governors, they must learn this lesson from other countries. Uh, President Xi Jinping of China has gone to major, major crackdown. He has sent a lot of government officers, including mayor, including governor, minister, go to jail. It's a big thing, they crack down. And in China, what they do is they have perfected the corruption. No money. So you can't say they take money from you. And they do it during the Chinese New Year, all right? Uh, during festival, like Christmas, for example. They say, hey, it's just, just part of our festival celebration. It's okay to give Christmas present, right? And you see, they're trying to hide it, cover it under cultural festivals. So they are very smart. They know how to play the game. But it's the same game. Whatever you call it, it's still crunch. Okay, isn't it? So, I don't know about your country, um, I don't want to know now, maybe you can tell me over coffee, yeah? <laughs> it's interesting. Everywhere I go, I listen to, oh, it's a very creative way of, you know. Uh, in Vietnam, I know of, uh, I, I'm a visiting professor there also, I know from a professor who told me, United Nations give them money, for example, to a bridge, to build a bridge, because the school children has to cross the river every time, and sometimes the river, they drown, they die in the river. But they take 10 years, they still haven't built a bridge. They have plenty of money, but why no bridge? Got money, no bridge. Why? Because money goes to the wrong pocket. You see, they don't want to bridge. Why? They don't want to build. Why? Because they can keep, keep getting money every year, and people keep drowning. Sad, yeah? And then in Vietnam, what happened? The kids, they're very creative. The parents put the kids, the kids are primary kids, six years, seven. They put them in a big plastic bag. They go into the big plastic bag, like a, like a rubber balloon ball, they tie it up, and they float it across the river. Oh my god, <laughs> they float in the rubber bag across the river. 
Sometimes the back puncture wasn't going the drop. So sad, you know. So, well, you see corruption. Everywhere, all sorts of country. I can tell you, I can write a book about corruption. All right? I go to Northern Thailand near Chiang Mai, government officer. You want to apply for passport, you want to apply for a license, you want to apply for a school, you have to wait two weeks. Two weeks to apply for a bloody license. In Singapore, you can do it in two seconds on the internet. Why two weeks? Because the mayor, the mayor of the village, you know mayor, the chief of the village, his brother is the chief of the government office. And the mayor has got a hotel and a restaurant and a shopping mall next to the immigration office. So you can stay for two weeks every day. Money, 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 money. Got it? Got it? And they say, welcome to a beautiful Chiang Mai village. Enjoy your stay. Enjoy your stay, of course, and enjoy. <laughs> money go to his pocket. You follow me? So you see, you go everywhere, you see all these things. It's, it's interesting, but it's also disgusting. You know, corruption. So I can write a book about it, but you know, <laughs> after writing the book that they throw me in jail, so <laughs> I better wait first. <laughs> Okay, this is a story about Singapore again. Okay? Why, how Singapore, to answer your question, how Singapore overcome corruption. Remember, number one, high salary. So the government officer will not take bribe. You take one dollar, you go to jail. I have got friends who have gone to jail. For some stupid reasons. Uh, this is also a bit sad for Singapore. We are too strict. I know one professor friend, okay, let me tell you. Uh, don't, don't tell me, though, yeah? it's not nice. He go to jail just for one month. Why? We have a claim form. As professors, we go visiting the schools, visiting offices sometimes. You can fill the claim for transport claim, you know, your petrol, how much you spend. You can claim for government transport claim. He overclaimed. He overclaimed by like $50. $50! Sometimes it's very hard to calculate, you know, the distance, you know what I mean? You have to calculate, like, it's very complicated formula. You have to calculate your distance from your house, the office, the office to your university, and, and so on. So after one year, sometimes you compete wrongly, maybe just $50, and you go to jail. Singapore is so strict. For $50, you go to jail. And he's not trying to cheat. Who which professor want to cheat for $50? It would be a stupid professor, right? It's not cheap. It's like, sometimes they make mistakes in the calculation, they don't understand the formulation, they change policy. Sometimes it happens. A bit too strict in Singapore case. But other country, too lenient, right? Okay, that's number one reason before you say you must pay your minister high pay to combat corruption. Number two, he was saying because he had need to attract the top brains, the top talent. Understand? The top talent. That means to say, uh, you got high IQ, high pay. Agree? Low IQ, low pay. Who agree? Agree? All agree? Then what happened if no IQ, no pay? Fair enough. Think about it. Okay? Think about it. Okay, another reason, the third reason, the point you say is, if you compare to the private sector, remember the multinational company, the big company, that got 200 million, 500 million turnover every year. The CEO, CFO, you know CEO, chairman? They are paid how much? They are paid 5 million, 10 million a year. 10 million dollars a year for just 200, 500 million company. Follow me? Whereas the minister in Singapore is paid only 1.7 million. And the turnover of Singapore economy, remember I showed you the slide, remember the slide I showed you? 300 billion. So as a percentage of the national GDP, which is nothing, it's only 0 0.001 percent. Whereas the MNC, multinational company, 10 million CEO out of 200 million, they're talking about 5 percent, 3 percent. In Singapore case, government only spend 0 0.001 percent. So as a percentage of GDP turnover, it is actually very small. Agree? Who agree? Who agree with Lee Kuan Yew thinking? Agree? Hands up, can I see any response? Guys in the back, do you follow? Do you agree with this reasoning? Do you agree or not? Hands up? Agree? Well, I respect your, your opinion, but I do not agree. Sorry Lee Kuan Yew, I do not agree with him. You know why? He is measuring, he is measuring the effectiveness of government, of its ministers by using pay, using salary, using monetary measurement, what we call quantitative measures. But I think in life, in government, you have also to look at, you must not forget the qualitative. You cannot just talk about money, money, money. High IQ, high pay. Low IQ, low pay. I'm not sorry, you say low IQ, just a sample. No IQ, no pay. 
No, I don't think you can use such monetary, very strict, very narrow approach. You follow me? What about things like passion, devotion, dedication, loyalty, love for your jobs? Understand? Understand? How do you measure those things? You cannot put a value to those things. You love your country, right? Will you do, will you work for your government for free? Maybe. Possible. People die for the country. People fight and die for the country. Right? So how do you measure those things? Can you put a monetary value on it? No. So in those things, you have to talk about passion, love, loyalty. Isn't it? For me, why it's just money, 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 money talk. No money, no talk. So therefore, I do not agree with Lee Kuan Yew. And in fact, he nearly lost one election because of this issue. Right. So there are good points and bad points. I'm not saying it's perfect. I think we have to go on. What time is it now? Uh, ooh, we have only 20 minutes almost. Thanks. Quick, quick. I prepared too much for you. <laughs> Thanks. Next. 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 We got to speed up. Next. Next. Uh, this is, oh, hang on. World millionaire. Can you see? Number. 3 million in the US, Germany 1 million, China 600,000, Hong Kong, Singapore only 100,000. Who agree? This chart is not accurate. You know why? We have to divide by the number of people, right? In terms of population, divide by the population. Singapore actually has the richest, highest number of million air because Singapore population is only 5 million per capita. You divide by the population per capita. Singapore has the biggest number of million air. That's why I said you want to be a million air, it's a very simple way of becoming a millionaire. Alright? I will tell you more later. If we have time. Next. Now these are all multi multi billionaire staying in Singapore now. This is the founder of H&M. You know H&M model? The fashion? Have you heard of H&M in, in Ukraine? No, you heard of H&M. You guys all know this, right? He's from Sweden. Now he's in Singapore. Singapore. Another billionaire, this guy, this cool dude is called, who knows? Eduardo Sagarin. Co-founder of Facebook. You, heard, you, you saw the movie, Social Media? Together with Mark Zuckerberg. He sued Mark Zuckerberg because Mark Zuckerberg wanted to, wanted to kick him out. And Zuckerberg paid him, I heard it's about 3 billion US dollar. 3 billion US dollar. And he changed his citizenship. He changed his citizenship from US to Singaporean citizenship one day before, one day before public listing Facebook on US, on US stock market. One day before, not one day after. Why? Pachimu. Why he changed his citizenship from the US to Singapore? Well done, the state money, no need to pay tax. I didn't know him, he's a multi billionaire. My friend in Singapore know him, he said he said 200 million US dollars, not Greek dollars, US dollars, 200 million by changing citizenship to Singapore one day before public listing of Facebook on the US stock market. My question. Will you change the citizenship from Ukraine to Singapore to save 200 million US dollars? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. You're very great, the professor next to you. <laughs> Would you? Will you change citizenship? Yes. Yes? No. Hey guys in the back, will you change the citizenship? For 200 million? Yes or no? How many? Can I see your hands? Very great students you have. I asked this question at other universities, all the students were like, you know, looking at each other. If I were your president, I would say, go. Go to Singapore. If you don't go, you're stupid. $200 million, US. If you don't go, you're stupid. Agree? And a president, as a president, I don't want stupid citizens in my country. Agree? You go, save your $200 million, and then come back later, help me build the university, build the school, build the hospital, build the airport, build the highway and everything. I'm sure your president will be very proud of you. Agree? 200 million can do a lot of good things. So if you don't go, you're stupid. Okay? Alright? So you can save and come back and help your country later. So these are all famous multi billionaires who has made Singapore their home. You know why? Next quickly. Because we have low taxes. They want to pay less tax. They can save tax. Singapore is one of the lowest taxes as you can see. Much lower than the US. The US is one of the highest. That's why Donald Trump has just announced his tax reform plan, right? Because of the tax problem in the US, international competition, next. And debt taxes, no joke. Before you die, you must pay tax. <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot die. You don't know about this, yeah? Okay. America has got one of the highest debt taxes. Japan, in fact, the highest, 
America is about 40%. And that's why Donald Trump, you know what happened last week? He tried to reform the tax. That means he wanted to make it zero. Zero. Now, it doesn't concern you and me, but for the multi-billionaire, it's big, big money. Because, you see what happened is that all these multi-billionaire, any, any man in America, in other countries, I think, 50% means when you die, if you have two houses, government take one house away. If you have two cars, they take one car away. If you have two dogs, they take one dog away. What happened if two wives? I don't know about you. <laughs> okay, so there's a danger here. Donald Trump just announced last week tax reform. Zero. That means all his rich multi-billion air friends are so happy. So happy with him. You think it's good? So when Donald Trump during his election campaign last year, he promised American people, right? He said, I know your frustration. I can help you. Vote for me. Vote for me. I can help you. Because I'm one of you. Do you believe it? He's one of them. We're talking about 80-90% of the common poor people in America. Does Donald Trump belong to the common 90%? No. Does Donald Trump belong to the top 10%? No. Where does he belong? He belongs to the top 0.001%. Don't forget, it's a multi-billionaire. The Trump casino, Trump hotel, Trump everything. His daughter Ivanka is already a billionaire. You know Ivanka, the beautiful daughter? Already a billionaire. In China, oh, Ivanka is a big brand. My friends in China were telling me, Ivanka doll, Ivanka brand, Ivanka fashion, Ivanka cosmetic, everything. In China alone, it's worth one billion. I'm not talking about other parts. So is, is Donald Trump? One of them, vote for me, I'm one of you. Come on, American people believe him. And you see what happened to the world now? Go back. Next. Does it look like you're going to die? Looks like he's going to die. Yeah. Are you sure? No, I mean, he refused, like, gave up on his tax. On the tax? Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's a lot of my American friends, I have many friends in America, they are very fed up because he is breaking his promise to his American people. Okay, any American friends here? I don't want to get involved in American politics, but people are getting fed up because apparently he has broken all his promises. Next. Uh, I was going to talk about how to be a millionaire in Singapore, but I don't know. Professor, how much time do we have? Uh, One minute? Two, three, two. So you want to be a millionaire? We may have to talk about it next time. Or maybe I'm the lecturer, come to me, buy me coffee, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> but I think very interesting, uh, in Singapore, uh, next. In Singapore, you know the car policy is very interesting. We talk, we talk about Lada, we talk about Ferrari. Singapore is the most expensive place in the world to buy a car and to run a car. Professor, how much a Toyota here cost? About 50,000, right? That's what Professor Sintaro Jajiko told me. They drive Toyota, they told me about 50,000 for a good Toyota company. In Singapore, it costs 200,000. More than 200,000. No joke. Most expensive place in the world to buy a car. Why? Because remember I said Singapore is so small, so we have to maximize land usage. You have to ask the question, would you rather use the land for running the car or use the land to build business offices, investment, housing and so on? So there's a competitive policy. Which one would you rather choose? You have to decide how to maximize the, the utility value of the land, so to speak. And even if you pay 500000 by my friend, you, pay, you just bought a Ferrari, 500000 Ferrari. 500,000. Lada, I don't know how much. <laughs> so, my friend, you pay 500,000 for your Ferrari, you can only use a car for maximum 10 years in Singapore. No joke. You pay 500,000, half a million US, you use for only 10 years. I don't care what kind of car. Whether it's Ferrari, BMW, whatever. 10 years. After 10 years, you have to drive your car to the scrap yard. Scrap yard, factory, And they will crush your car. Then your car becomes the most expensive Coca-Cola can in the world. How sad. You go back home, you tell your wife, Honey, this is my our Ferrari. At least you can drink yeah, every day. Right? So, very sad, but very effective. We manage the car population. That's why in the whole Asia, Singapore, we do not have the kind of very serious traffic jam that you can find in Bangkok, Jakarta, Saigon, and so on. Because we manage, we control our car population. This is another example of how we manage it through active government intervention policy. I know if you do this in UK, you might have a revolution. 500,000 a car, you crush it, become Coca Cola. Okay. okay, I have so much, because the rector wanted me to share so much, I prepared hundreds and hundreds of slides, but because too bad time is running out. Um, 
you know, so we may have to talk about this next time. Uh, you can ask the professor or your, uh, your rector, they might be back again for more lectures, especially on the time how to make a million US dollars, you know, that is a very important secret. Uh, I'm afraid there's no time. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, as usual with other universities, I forgot, uh, can you? Uh, let me give you my contact in, in case you have any questions to ask, uh, to, to to drop me a line uh, if you look at this. Uh, this is my this is my email. No, don't hang on. Let me type my email. Can you see? Gary three three at gmail dot com. Okay. Oh, nothing. Oh, I think a connection. Okay, um, you want to take down my, my email in case you have any questions to ask or anything or you want to visit Singapore or Asia or, you know. Gary Lit, as in G-A-R-Y-L-I-T-3-3 at gmail.com. What is happening to the protection? G-A-R-Y L-I-T as in Germany Apple, Russia, Yellow London, India, Thailand number 33 at gmail.com Okay, now uh, can I request to have a picture with everybody? Okay, you stay where you are mm -hmm. You stay where you are, Professor Can I invite you, maybe you can sit or stand here in front yes. Thank you, thank you for for your two hours of patience listening to me, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.